Oh, ooh, 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 ooh. Head Games. Written by the authors of the critically acclaimed novel Huan and Ray Take on America. It all begins in New York City, where dreams are either brought to life or turned to ashes. We enter a high rise on the Upper East Side, home to some of the richest, greediest, scums of the earth as well as a few nice folks. It's a sunny, weekday morning and the traffic is slow and abundant as it would be any other time of day or night in this city. A white limo pulls in front of the building. After waiting a minute, which is the equivalent of a century in Manhattan, the driver impatiently calls the cell phone of the person that's supposed to be ready to go. We see the cell phone of that man getting called vibrating on the desk, while in his luxurious penthouse he is popping one of the last remaining quaaludes while three women in various states of consciousness and undress lie on his bed. He has medium-length unkempt hair and has an attractive face that some years of hard living aged prematurely. The man finally picks up his vibrating phone and says keep your shirt on I'll be right there. Jeez. He puts on a white button-down shirt and some khaki pants. He grabs his guitar and slams the door, not bothering to lock it. When he enters the elevator down the hall, he manages to awkwardly squeeze in with an elderly woman. He stands in the elevator as it descends to the lobby. It feels eerie and quiet, so he takes out his guitar and strums a few chords to break the silence. The two ride down together seemingly unaware of each other's presence. Both are in their own respective worlds letting Chad's music be their mutual calming device. The elevator door opens, and they walk into the beautiful, spacious lobby. He pushes through the revolving door of the building, walks toward the big white limo, and sees Daniel, Chad's clearly pissed off driver. Damn it Chad, you certainly live up to the stereotype of the perpetually late rock star. Let's get a move on. The meeting starts at 10. Says Daniel. Chad enters the giant stretch that awaited him. It was tricked out to the nth degree. Bulletproof siding and windows. Chrome wheels, an interior that rivaled the most extravagant of private jets. They ride through Midtown into Times Square. Chad couldn't miss the gigantic billboard that at one time had his face on it. He tries to daydream in his brief few minutes of silence. That came to an end when his limo entered the parking garage of a luxurious office building. He entered the elevator along with a few other people. One person in particular. A larger, imposing man, was looking at Chad, giving him discomfort. There was a familiarity to this man. Chad's painful memories began surfacing in his mind, and he had no idea why. He needed to get out of this confined space and clear his head. He got off the elevator and so did the mysterious man. Chad began walking quickly, not looking behind him. The man was following him. He was approaching the office where the meeting was being held. He was running late of course. The big time executives and some interns too were waiting impatiently. All of a sudden, in his peripheral vision, he saw the mysterious man. He turned around to face him, studying him and wondering what the man's motive was and how it involved him. Why are you following me? said Chad. I saw you in the elevator. You were staring at me in there. You look very familiar to me. Who are you? There's a lot you need to know. I need you to come with me Chad says the man. Chad stopped. He could feel every muscle in his body tightening. The mysterious man had changed his appearance to the point he was hardly recognizable, as he did whenever he got himself in a jam. But, Chad would know that scratchy, deep, smoky voice anywhere. It was Derek. A dick of a name for a dick of man. To an outsider, Derek might look harmless in his tailored dress pants and navy blue polo shirt, but he wasn't. Chad closes his eyes and takes a deep breath, trying to squelch flashbacks of that night several years ago. The night he got the call that his sister Lexi had been rushed to the hospital. The night she died at the hand of the man standing right in front of him. It took every fiber of restraint for Chad not to lunge at and kill him. It took so long to get over her death. 
He woke up most nights sweating in panic thinking about her and that phone call. He worried most about his parents who had told everyone they were getting by okay, but he saw the change in them. It was like a light went off that never came back on. The most frustrating thing about her death though was the lack of closure. Why did she have to die? What was she involved in? And why was her killer back in his life now? Chad realized everything was about to change. Before figuring out Derek's mysterious identity, getting on top of the music industry was his only goal. Now he had much bigger goals in mind. He vowed to spend every fiber of his being to find closure on what his sister did that caused Derek to kill her. She was an innocent victim, dragged into Chad's destructive lifestyle. He swore he would seek revenge. Derek was going to pay for her death and now standing right in front of him was an opportunity to do so. He had to figure out what he was going to do next here. Derek was an imposing figure. Chad was fairly strong, and he had been in a few fights in his time but there was no chance he would have been able to take him down in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You have some set on you deciding to show up here and now. You deserve to be rotting in a jail cell until the day you die. Chad tells him. Chad. How would you like to reunite with your sister? I can arrange that for you. If you don't cooperate, your world is about to turn to major shit. Derek tells him right before the sound of a few voices start coming from down the hall. Upon hearing them, Derek takes off as if escaping from a danger. It was sudden, unexpected and extremely confusing. Chad shook his head forcefully from side to side trying to loosen the hold of the thoughts parading through his mind. It was like that scene from Jumbo with pink elephants stampeding through his brain playing trumpets and cymbals. They were loud and all-encompassing but he couldn't do this. Not here. He was sure Derek was watching his every move. Derek would love to know how on edge Chad was feeling from this brief encounter. Chad, never one to bow to others, would not concede to Derek. Chad ran his fingers through his just long enough, shaggy brown hair. He would go back to his penthouse later and try to piece together what had just transpired, but for now he had to figure out what his next move was going to be. The group of executives he had come to see was now calling his name, beckoning him to join them in their conference room. He was not in a state to start planning his next career move. It was time. He decided, to stop thinking about all of this and actually do something. He ran away from the doorway of the meeting room, which left everyone in a bit of shock, and ran down the stairs, through the lobby and into the limo which was still idling outside the building. He had a feeling Derek was going to have someone on his tail, so he tells the driver to drive into another garage where he had his unregistered Audi parked and slipped into that. His heart was still beating fast, so he popped in at Even and a few minutes later drove out into the busy Manhattan street. He needed some place to think. He decided to call his longtime, loyal friend Gary a very rich big-time hedge fund manager who was staying in his house in the Hamptons. Gary had been with Chad through some of his darkest moments, including that awful night his sister died. Gary knew all about Eric and what heartache he was responsible for. Chad filled him in briefly and told him he was heading there now. Chad had forgotten how long it took to get across Long Island. It felt even longer because of the circumstances. He passed several houses that he equated to castles. Then he got to old Gary's mansion. It was an older Victorian style. It had white siding with a dark roof and shutters. Not the biggest place in the area but any real estate here might as well be made of gold thought Chad. He pulled through the winding driveway to see Gary looking down at him from a balcony with a cocksure smile that he always had. His shirt was open and he was smoking a blunt. He still looks a lot like a young Tom Hanks thought Chad. Gary always denied it when it was brought up though. Chad parked the car and ran up to Gary's front door which was already unlocked. He went inside and saw Gary walking down the stairs. Chad's breathing was heavy from the anxiety rebuilding inside him. He ran and hugged his old friend almost breaking into tears. 
Chad please try to relax. You are safe here. I have this place well guarded. When you can, tell me what happened. Gary tells him. Chad explains how he saw Derek in the city and how he tried to lure him to go with him. Gary was just as confused as Chad was when he first found out. So, he came back. That sick son of a bitch. Gary responds, I came here to get your help and find a way to get closure for Lex's death. Chad replies in a desperate tone, I can help you with that, Gary said. After a brief pause, they both went into the foyer. Chad looked around the spacious interior and whistled in admiration. You managed well with those brains of yours. You certainly made it big. Gary wonders if that is another Tom Hanks joke. But he dismisses that thought. Sure did. So, let's use some of my resources to figure out a way to take down this Derek before he decides he is done playing games with you. He takes Chad into the basement to boot up his computer and huge server network of investors, both criminal and semi-criminal, to see if any of them could provide a lead. They sign on his computer, and he says, Did you get mail? Gary chuckles as he says, OK it's enough with the Tom Hanks jokes now. Let's get down to business. He converses with these big time investors and begins to run a thorough background check to see if Derek had killed anyone else that would have a direct effect on Chad. The background check reveals that Derek had a few unpaid parking tickets, but nothing major. I'm sorry, buddy, Gary said trying to comfort a distraught Chad. I don't understand it. Chad's rant began. That slippery little dick. I know what he's done. You know what he's done. How could there be no red flags anywhere in his background check? It was then that the obvious occurred to Chad. Wait. If he can change his appearance so drastically on a whim, maybe he could change his criminal history. That's a stretch Chad. So, you think he's taken on a whole new identity this whole time to avoid murder charges? He must have some pretty heavy connections to be able to pull that off, said Gary. Yeah I know which makes this whole situation even more fucked up because I don't know who else I'm dealing with here. What is with this guy? Is he after me now? Is the rest of my family in danger? Gary are you listening to me? Calm down Chad. Don't jump to conclusions here. Just stay here, pop some quaaludes, go upstairs, try to rest your body and mind, and we'll try to figure this out later. Chad went to peruse the wide selection of anti-anxiety medications in Gary's kitchen. After taking one, he went upstairs to pass out on the guest room bed. After waiting a while, Gary picked up the phone and dialed. After someone picked up, he said, Elvis has entered the building. A raspy voice on the other end said, I would like an autograph. After passing this little test, Gary continued, he's here. No. He doesn't suspect a thing, he thought I was genuinely helping. Yes. He will be here tonight. Yes, see you then. He hung up. An hour later, loud thumping noises were coming from the upstairs which startles Gary. Chad was up, much calmer than he was before and walked downstairs. He found Gary, sitting on the balcony smoking from a bong. Chad disregards this and says I've got to figure out why this scum of the earth was out to get my sister and me. He walks back down to log on to Gary's personal computer. He still was having trouble finding a lead. There was no available information on Derek's past or present. No news stories linking him to Lexi's murder, let alone any details on suspects to her murder. It was as if he didn't exist. Chad and Gary spent the next few hours trying to piece together what had happened, until out of exhaustion Chad decides that he would think more clearly in the morning and heads upstairs back to the guest room. After a short period of sleep, he wakes up to sounds coming from downstairs. He thinks it must be Gary, perhaps talking to someone overseas about business. Suddenly he hears the ring of a doorbell. He walks downstairs to see what all the commotion is about. Expecting company this late Gary? I can get that for you if you're too busy. 
Chad said as he began walking across the elegant black and white tiles that lined Gary's kitchen. No. Gary barked, lunging towards the door so quickly he knocked over a pitcher of orange juice which splashed on Chad as he was walking past the table. What the fuck, man? Why did you have to run so recklessly? Now am I all sticky? A juice-covered Chad demands. Ah, uh, sorry. It's just you're a guest and I think it's just that religious cult coming around again wanting me to join them. Gray explains, take something out of my room and get out of those clothes. Chad scoffs and heads for the stairs wondering what the fuck that was all about. A guest? Chad had never been a guest with Gary. Ever. They were like brothers. They shared everything. Something was up, but Chad forced himself to overlook it. With so much going on, he didn't have time to figure out Gary's odd behavior. Meanwhile, downstairs, Gary opened the door, good evening gentlemen, sorry for the delay. Business comes at all hours. The one you're looking for is in the guest house right now. He might still be asleep. Stay quiet though, or he'll hear you coming, Gary says, and lay low. If he sees you, it's over. Gary instructs them as he quietly shuts the door behind them. Chad changes his clothes and tries to wash himself but was still pissed and kind of sticky from the Odge incident, the juice spilling, not the 1995 trial where Odge got away with double homicide though that did kind of piss him off too. He approaches the stairs and stops when he hears Gary talking to someone. He starts walking down to see what was up. Gary quickly hangs up the phone as Chad enters the room. Yo Gary you losing it down here? I heard you arguing with someone. Who were you talking to just now? Hey Chad sorry but no a telemarketer called trying to get me to switch my cleaning service to a group of people from another third world country. I told them I had great results from Guatemala and had no intention of venturing elsewhere. But anyway, I'm glad you got the juice out just wait here I'll be right back. I think I heard that cult rummaging through the garbage out near the guest house. I'll finish doing those dishes when I get back. For the second time Chad felt like there was something very strange going on with Gary. Try as he might, he couldn't shake it as easily as last time. What could he be up to? He'd never questioned his relationship with Gary. And now Derek was mucking up that too. Chad felt his anger flooding him once again. His thoughts were interrupted suddenly when he looked down and saw his shoes were sticky. That bothered him. He shuffled over to the sink to grab a sponge. Of course, Gary hadn't cleaned the floor or the counter from the Odge's gruesome death. Chad chuckled to himself at the reference. As he waited for the water to warm up he absent-mindedly stared out the window which faced the guest house. The shades were drawn, but the bright moon cast shadows, illuminating not one, but two silhouettes standing inside. With a jolt of confusion and fury Chad dropped the sponge. In a state of panic, he thought about all the peculiar things that had happened tonight. Who was Gary talking to and what exactly was going on in that guest house? Something fishy was definitely going on. Chad felt his body starting to shake and his stomach tighten. He sprinted outside and heard some muffled voices. He could not make out the one voice, but the other sounded like Gary. Who was this other voice? He thought and what are they discussing? Perhaps, he thought he was hearing things. Then the silhouettes disappeared. He wandered over to the guest house, hiding behind the neatly trimmed square hedges. A small pier to the bay was on the other side, along with a small yacht. He pressed an ear to the side of the house, listening to whatever was going on in there. He could faintly hear two voices. One was Gary of course, but who the hell was he talking to? Thought Chad. You said he was in the guest house. We've scoured the whole place and he's nowhere to be found. You leading us on? He was in here when I left him. Maybe he went back to the main house to get something. We're not here to play games. He's coming with us now or our boss will hold you responsible. Chad wishes he still had his quaaludes as he was getting anxious about what exactly was going on. 
Suddenly he gets a text from a restricted number saying get out of that house now. The people you know aren't what they seem. Chad thinks what a strange fortune cookie like text. He was torn on what to do next. He hears a loud screeching car sound coming from outside. The voices he was heard started sounding panicky. Oh, shit they're here. They didn't think I could handle this. Chad suddenly put together that he was definitely not safe here, and he needed to sneak out of here somehow. He runs back into the house to find his car keys. They were not where he had left him. He runs into Gary's foyer and grabs a mace that Gary kept as a decoration for some reason. He hears voices from outside getting louder and runs into the garage hoping to lift the door and to drive away and escape. Loud voices were clearly coming from the inside now. Chad knew he had to act fast, or they will start scouring the house and find him. He goes up to the garage door and tries opening it but it was too heavy and his anxiety was really kicking in. He has to risk hitting the button and alerting them to his location. So he finds the opener, hits it, and waits by the door opening. He hears more loud shouts and knows they were coming. When the door was just high enough to fit through, Chad drops down and rolls. He gets up quickly and starts running as fast as he can. He looks back to make sure no one is following him yet and realizes he'd only made it about 25 feet away from the house. Blood pumps through his body at a rapid rate. He keeps time with each beat of his heart as it ricochets through his eardrums. Things are looking pretty bleak. When he tries to stand, his ankle wiggles like jello that had been molded into some bizarre shape on a picnic table in the summer. That was something else he'd never understand. Why are jello molds even a thing? He thought, who was the first person that was like, let's scoop some glue stuff out of animal bones, mix it with flavoring and serve it as a weird wiggly confection. Chad shook his head. He didn't have time to contemplate the aspirations of Frenchmen before his time. He tried to focus, but even standing was a chore. It dawned on him that maybe he could hide in one of the cars. He dragged himself along the ground, opened the driver's door and fought gravity to get in. He glanced out the front window and something shiny caught his eye. They'd left the keys. He either had the dumbest kidnappers in the world after him or it was a trap. He glanced over at his own car that he arrived in, tires obviously slashed. He turned the key. Suddenly, he could feel a tube of cold steel against his neck. Drive, now, said a masculine voice. Okay, so it was a trap, thought Chad. He peeled out of the driveway across the lawn toward the main road, still hearing the men yelling at each other and ransacking the house. A few saw him leave through one of the windows though. They began piling into their cars. They immediately began shooting toward the tires in an attempt to pop them. He was a good distance away, but they were quickly gaining on him. Whoever was holding the gun was clearly not on their side. A bullet whizzed by, hitting a tree branch. As Chad hit the gas, the man in his car took the gun away. The surge of adrenaline overcame his overwhelming panic for the time being. Sorry about that, but I needed to make sure you cooperated. I have come to help. Jim Walters sent me. Chad was still reeling from the betrayal of Gary. But he spoke up anyway. The fuck? Jim Walters? It was his old bassist before the band split up. Chad was trying to make sense of this. His supposedly best friend had betrayed him and was teaming up with some gang of men who were probably working for Derek, but a friend of Jim Walters came to help. That made no sense. How can I believe this strange man? Chad thought. Jim Walters and I had it out before he quit. Why would he help? He said to this strange man. The way Derek and now Gary operates, this could be another disguise or way to take me down. It's hard to believe there are any allies these days. He started to feel the effects of panic again, so his thought process was not clear. He started to hastily run off while this so-called ally was running behind him reassuring him nothing was wrong. He could not take any chances. 
Chad was suddenly all alone. He came to a dead end and had no way to escape. There had to be some way he could get out of there but his vision was too blurry to think straight. He then heard two familiar voices and two shadows coming his way. I wonder who that can be, he thought, as his whole body starting shaking. He also began to turn as white as a ghost. Chad was on the verge of passing out. He tried to run forward but his legs gave out, and he collapsed and passed out. He went in and out of consciousness but could feel himself being lifted and then getting tossed into a vehicle. Seconds later, there was silence, followed by darkness. A while later, the light came back on. Chad slowly returned to consciousness. He woke up to a loud beeping noise. He was in some sort of hospital bed feeling groggy but relatively pain-free. His whole body felt wet with sweat. There was some sort of IV in his arm. He had discovered the source of the noise being the I.V machine. The bag connected to his arm was empty. He sat up and found himself in what appeared to be an underground shelter but with all the amenities you'd find in a nicer hotel room. Hello. Is someone there? Chad called out to no answer. Hello. Please respond. I just woke up and have no idea what's going on Chad screamed and still no response. The metal door was thick and it was locked from the outside. There was a thick glass window showing only darkness. The more awake he got the more anxious he became. Then a lady came running in. Oh good, you're awake, she said. Where am I? Chad demanded. Please hold still and I will fix the I.V she told him. You didn't answer my question lady, where am I and why do I have a needle in my arm? Said Chad well where you are I cannot tell you just yet. As for the second part, I was instructed by my employer to clean out your blood of all toxins and keep you comfortable. Okay well who is your employer and why am I stuck in this room? My employer will be down in a moment. Please just relax and know that we are only here to help you. You were on the brink of being killed from your pursuers before we were able to find and rescue you. Chad starts remembering the events in the Hamptons at Gary's house more clearly. I remember trying to run away and then I blacked out and woke up in this place so now I have a needle in my arm and you not giving me any answers. Chad screamed. That's because she can't give you answers Chad a voice exclaims. Chad turns to see Jim Walters coming into view. Hello Chad, I know it's been a while since we last talked. Our career paths definitely took us in different directions the past few years and I apologize for not reaching out. It seemed like you were finding quite a bit of success going the solo route. It wasn't surprising given the amount of talent we all knew you had. But right now, is not about our past but about our future. I had you locked in here because I was afraid you'd run out and if you did it's likely you would have been killed. Neither of us are safe anymore. I'm sure these past couple of years have been difficult. Dealing with such a personal tragedy and all. You see your sister getting killed was not an accident. Chad began getting major deja vu here. Jim continued, you're in my safe house but it's likely not going to be safe much longer. We have to get out of here and join the rest of the group as soon you're fully clean. Wait just one goddamn minute here Jim. Before I move one more step, I need you to give me some answers. First and foremost, how did you know where I was? Second, what do you know about Derek and why is he back and after both of us? Asked Chad. Well finding you was easy. After Derek came after me, I narrowly escaped to here. Then I sent Ivan to tail you in case you were his next target. Lo and behold, he went after you at your publishing company. Ivan followed you to your friend's house, then when you were ambushed by Derek's crew, he jumped in to rescue you. Jim paused to let Chad absorb that. We think that Derek wants to finally finish us off. A ringing noise occurred. Jim got up, looking at a message that got sent to him. He told Chad to wait a moment and stepped out. Jim runs back in the room, and he was out of breath. What's wrong? Chad asked. We just got word that some of Derek's crew were spotted in the area. 
We can't take a chance. We have to leave now and join the others. Said Jim. I thought I can't leave now Chad said, but I guess I don't have much of a choice, so let's go. They then sprinted out of the so-called safe place. Jim, once we meet up with the others, we should all flee the country. It's the only way Derek won't find us. No, we can't keep running any longer. I know some place that's perfect. We can meet up with the rest of the resistance. It's time for countermeasures, said Jim. Chad grit his teeth. Yeah, let's get that bastard, said Chad. Revenge is exactly what he had in mind. Jim continued, it's right under Derek's nose too. We're going back to the Big Apple. Jim and Ivan packed as many belongings as they could. Jim ordered the staff he was paying to go home because their services were no longer required. Ivan was upset that he would have to give up back massages from that attractive nurse. Chad got in Jim's silver Audi along with Ivan. I can't believe they found us so fast, are you sure you weren't followed Ivan? said Jim. Ivan looked into Jim's eyes and said. Earnestly trust me, we were not followed. Our guest here gave me some trouble, but those goons were incompetent drivers. Within twenty minutes Chad, Jim, and Ivan are hightailing the Long Island Expressway en route back to Manhattan. Chad was now fully alert and filled with building anxiety. So, Jim can you please tell me why Derek is back in our lives and seems hell-bent on killing us? Also, what the hell is the resistance and why are they meeting in one of the most densely populated cities in the world? Asks Chad. I'll give you the whole story when we get there. There's certain things you need to know that I can't tell you. We'll be there soon so just hold tight. A little while later, the car crossed the bridge into Manhattan and turned into a garage of what seemed like a very unlikely location for where the resistance could be, Trump Tower. Inside, they walked into the main lobby carrying their minimal luggage. Instead of checking into a room, they head to a Starbucks on the second level. They pass by an enormous portrait of Donald Trump with an eagle and flag poised behind him. In Trump we trust it says on the bottom. At the Starbucks, Chad tries to order a cappuccino but Jim pushes him aside and orders a mango margarita. The cashier squints his eyes and asks, hold the banana? Chad wonders what kind of weird ass Starbucks this is. When Jim says yes, the cashier leads the group to the bathroom, locks the door, and he twists a bolt under the sink like a combo lock. The wall slides open and the group minus the cashier walks through a damp, narrow tunnel lit with some flickering lighting. The tunnel grows wider as the floor slopes downward. Finally, they reach a door to what looks like a fallout shelter built into the wall. There is an intercom speaker with buttons mounted on the right side. Chad thinks to himself about how murky and unkept this locale is compared to the glistening golden lobby and bustling activity now above them. They enter the shelter and go down a long hallway. The decorating looks to be from a much older generation as if the shelter had not been used in at least 50 years. They pass by what looks like cryogenic chambers and many large refrigerators. They eventually get to a heavy looking door with a key code reader. Jim enters a code and the door opens. Unbelievably inside is a very luxurious foyer with an obnoxious golden chandelier dangling overhead. Chad hears chattering coming from the next room. Jim says this way Chad. Time to introduce you to the rest of the party. They enter the room and Chad's eyes widen. Among the guests in the room was Nick Swagger, Don Letty, Saul McCrusty and David Beloth. Chad couldn't believe artists of that caliber were all together in this strangely placed fallout shelter. Jim am I still going through withdrawals or is this really happening? Nick Swagger speaks with his distinctive accent you better bloody believe this is happening now. We've waited long enough for you to get here. You know a killer is out there and you escape to the Hamptons? Rookie mistake mate. Jim speaks all right let's start from the beginning and tell you what we know. Meanwhile, not far away from the fallout shelter, Derek is talking to a mysterious figure. 
we had a lead on their location but it seems like they moved. It's just a matter of time before we find them all. Derek says. Well time is ticking so I hope you have a plan in place. I'd hate for us to have to resort to unfortunate but necessary means. The figure says. I have a good idea in place. Just give me a little more time. I know he'll come around once he learns the truth. Back in the bunker underneath Trump Tower, everyone was gathered around a giant table in a dining area. There was even a chandelier hanging from the ceiling. A projector was shining onto a screen which was set up on the wall between some decorative drapes. Saul McCrusty, the de facto leader of the group, was struggling with the remote to a slideshow. Nick Swagger was dipping into the booze stash and passing around drinks now that everyone was here. Bloody remote won't work, said Saul, shaking it wildly. Pointed at the forking projector, you anchor, said Fozzy. Willie Mole came over and put in some new batteries, but it still didn't work. Finally, he walked over to press the buttons on the projector itself. A picture of Bert Cocaine appeared on the screen as well as some newspaper articles about his death. All of you are aware of this tragedy, but some of you may not know the truth. This was Derek's first successful slaying. Chad was as surprised at this revelation as he would have been before a couple of days ago. He felt like he was dreaming again. No way. That's bullshit. He couldn't help yelling despite the fact that he was in the presence of so much fame. Bert was his childhood hero. He couldn't accept that Derek had claimed his life too. He couldn't count the amount of times he jammed out to smells like teen spirit. Saul ignored Chad and continued his briefing. It didn't stop with Bert. Tons of young artists dying just entering the peak of their fame have been linked to Derek. Serena, Tupac, Jiggy, Amy Beerhouse. Even Michael Waxon's death has been attributed to Derek having some sort of strange relationship with the doctor who treated Michael. I'm sure this seems impossible to believe since a lot of these deaths have supposedly been solved but we believe there was too many unanswered questions involved. And if you're wondering why we haven't involved the police or the feds, it's because we have reasons to believe that Derek or whoever Derek works for has a significant connection to someone very high up the ladder at the bureau who would easily dismiss any charges. So. We're in an unfortunate position because as rich and powerful as most of us are, there's someone or some kind of higher power that's out to get us and there's no way by any sort of conventional means we can stop them. Chad sat the dumbfounded by the fact that Derek was a part of this pseudo-terrorist organization that was targeting music artists and that the most famous and successful artists in the world were gathered in this Cold War bunker collaborating on a plan to stop him. So, our best option is a united front. That's why we are gathered here today. We need to come up with a plan to deal with this threat before it gets another hot young act or even worse one of us. Everyone sat in the room silently staring at each other. They all were thinking hard about a cohesive yet stealthy plan that would not let Derek strike again. In the midst of all this outside the door they heard a loud noise and several voices. Chad walked toward the door to see what was going on when Jim sprinted over to the door to block him from leaving. Jim yelled, don't open that door Chad. Derek or one of his spies could be nearby waiting for their next victim. Chad realized he was right and ran away from the door and went back to where he was. Jim says, okay people who has a good idea? Billy Strong pulled Chad and Jim aside and gave them a stiff drink to calm their nerves. Look guys, I know you just got out of a mess with Derek Schoons plus we're laying this shitstorm on you, but you're safe here with us. There's no sense running around like a couple of basket cases. This bunker was built by the government to protect scientists and politicians during the height of the Cold War against bomb blasts. There's no way they're going to find us down here. They returned to their seats. Bozo cleared his throat. So, since we can't trust the authorities, I propose that we send some of our own as spies into Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. 
Wait a minute bozo. What exactly are we all going to be doing in those boroughs? We'll be sitting ducks just strolling around with that bloody nutcase out there. Asks Nick Swagger. Saul answers good question Nick. The best way we're going to lure out Derek is with a big gathering. Something high profile that will be a perfect setting for a tragic death of a well-known artist and cause memorabilia prices to soar. We're all going to put on a concert. We'll bill it as a one night only first come first enter extravaganza. What we need is misdirection. Build up the hype in all five boroughs and get the word spread that this could be bigger than Woodstock and with more drugs and violence. Chad sat there in astonishment as the group nodded their heads in agreement at the latest plan that was proposed. Then he felt excitement. A concert. He couldn't remember the last time that he performed with other musicians. Plus, with the most famous musicians in the world. Chad's daydream was interrupted when he heard a loud buzz and realized another person had arrived at the door. Some of the group groaned as if they knew who it was. Clash walked over to the intercom. He pressed the button to talk. It's me Justin Bleeder. Sorry I'm late, I was too busy running from some crazy fans. Ha ha. I brought some sandwiches from where? Clash sighed, they weren't your fans bleeds, they were probably trying to beat you up. We went over this last time, our group is for musicians that aren't hated by most of the public for our music. Otherwise they're not under a threat by Derek. Clash slams the door on Bleeds and returns to the group who are beginning the planning process for Woodstock 2.0, the sequel. Sol is on the phone with his agent. Yes, I want to book the entire Central Park for this mate. It's the only way we'll be able to fit everyone and make sure security is strong enough for everything short of a deranged psychopath specifically targeting musicians. Yes, I just said that. Don't question me. He hangs up the phone and tells everyone to get into groups. Chad's group leader is Willie Mole who begins playing the piano and talking about being under pressure in Miami 2017 on his down Easter Alexa and other strange sayings crowbarring in his obscure song titles. Chad later finds out that these are all code words for when they open fire on Derek and his crew. Let's all head out to our safe zones, said Saul. Since we're a large high-profile bunch let's stick to our groups until the concert so there's less a chance of him wiping us all out. Willie Mole gets off his piano and tells his group of Chad, Jim, Chili Bridal, and Billy Ligstrong you can all stay with me tonight at my penthouse here in the city. There's enough security to kill ISIS. The group leaves the bunker takes an elevator to the roof of Trump Tower and takes the helicopter with WM written on it. They fly off the tower and go to another high building and land on the roof. They get out of the chopper and enter the building below. Heavily armed security guards lead them down a hallway to a door. They open the door and enter the luxurious penthouse awaiting them. Inside, the setting sun gleamed over the city rooftops straight through the glass windows that covered most of the wall on both the north and west sides of the building. Most of the furniture was white leather. Curiously, a moose head was mounted over the fireplace. Mole explained that he was against killing animals, but his tour bus hit it in New Hampshire. Along the two remaining walls were golden record awards that the two billies immediately started comparing to their own awards. They start squabbling over the best type of font to spell their name as their big egos dictated. Chad stared at the pool out back, it reminded him of home. He wondered what became of his old pad and whether it had been ransacked to hell by now. Jim asked about the glass walls. That was not good for being inconspicuous even if they were on the 20th floor. Chad wondered if Derek had access to a military-grade helicopter, but at this point this was hard to doubt. Willie Mole whistled. Suddenly instead of the city, they were looking at the beach. He whistled again and they were in the Arctic. He explained that the windows were actually high-tech screens to display many outside scenes. Chad was impressed that a guy his age was so tech-savvy. Jim made a beeline to the fridge, grabbing some cold ones. 
the stressful night demanded a continuous stream of alcohol. A butler arrived with the rest of their luggage which included guitar cases. Bridal and Legstrong took out their respective guitars and started a jam session to practice for the big concert-slash-supervillain trap. Jim was on the phone talking to his Cossack bodyguard Ivan that was excluded from the musician-exclusive meeting under Trump Tower. He wanted him to stay out of this mess because this was a personal vendetta even though Ivan would be an asset in the battle. Chad remembered that was the guy that drove him to Jim's place after he passed out the first time. Chad looked for a change of clothes in Mole's closet. Meanwhile across town in an undisclosed location, Derek is at an indoor shooting range where we have a montage of him shooting a variety of different high-powered weapons ranging from a Desert Eagle to a Barrett M82 sniper rifle at decoy targets in slow motion while Take My Breath Away by Berlin plays in the background. Derek's aim is precise as it's always been. He could have been a sharpshooter in the Navy SEALs if things had gone differently. He sees in his security camera TV, a man knocking on the door. Derek recognizes him and leaves the range to go answer the door. You got a lot of balls showing up here after that last screw up. Derek says. Don't you worry, I know how he is and what he'll do next, just let me handle this please, says the man. I've heard this bullshit before and I'm inclined to doubt you very highly but you'll have to do things my way and if we fail again this will all be for nothing. Derek says as he motions him to come inside. Back at the mole abode, Bridal and Legstrong are still jamming to a combination of black wedding and casket face. Neither wants to have to play back up vocals so it's a bit of mess. Mole gets off the phone and tells Chad and Jim that Saul's people secured the entire park for a week from today so they had to work fast to get everything together. This had to have the look, feel and sound of an actual concert with enough time for a strategic coup of a serial killer when the moment's right. Now that that was settled, Mole whips out a microphone with a stand from a cabinet for Chad. A piano unfolds from one of the normal walls instead of a bed. He passes out a bass guitar to Jim. They join the two other men with their rehearsal and try to get a good sound going for the big night. After a few hours, it stops sounding like a clusterfuck of different genres and starts to sound coherent. It was late by that time so they all decided to get some rest. Their group as well as the other groups had still had some time to come up with something throughout the week. Elsewhere in the city, we check in with one of the other groups. They were in a dark open room illuminated by flashing television screens. Saul McCrusty settles things with the Central Park people and gets use of all available NIPT and EMS workers in case things get real. Saul calls Nick Swagger and Willie Mole to tell them it's booked. He tells his assistant to have them prepare his private jet for takeoff. He turns to his team of Bozo, Robert Slant and Steve Farble of Dash South. Gents come with me. We have to make a trip out west. I know some people that could help us. They have dealt with crazy psychopaths before. Back in an undisclosed location, the man follows Derek down a seemingly endless hallway until they stop at a rather large door with a keypad lock. Derek covers his hand and puts in the password and the door hisses and slowly opens. They go inside the room where a giant screen sits against the wall. Derek clicks a button and the screen turns on showing a dark shadowy figure. Without showing themselves, a voice says why did you bring him down here? Derek says because he might be our best bet in saving our friend and I don't want to let an opportunity go. Plus. This could get real ugly and we might need a hand or two. Okay sit down the two of you says the voice word is they're planning some kind of performance in the park. They're expecting you. Here's how we play this to our advantage. We teasingly switch scenes to 30,000 feet in the air where the private jet Saul McCrusty and his group are on is flying. It's a very spacious and elegant Gulf Stream that would make Air Force One look commercial. The four artists are sitting in the bar area having Domper Eignan and sharing funny at the time Rody stories. Finally, Bozo asks us all who exactly are we meeting up with in California? 
you left us pretty high and dry on details. Great question. A little while back, I was doing a gig at the Hollywood Bowl and I met up with this guy after the show. He had a hell of a story. Immigrant, came over with his brother, got involved in some crazy mafia related shit. Now he's living it up tax free in Santa Monica running his own empire. Saul laboriously told the tale of Juan and Ray. It was an amazing story, so amazing and wild it had to have been made up. But he insisted it was true. Those two immigrants had somehow overthrown the nationally infamous Phoenix Phil, formerly Philadelphia Phil, mob boss along with the help of his estranged son. It was covered up by the government, and Juan and Ray had been given a tax free home in Santa Monica as stated earlier. Now Juan has rapidly risen to be a huge criminal influence in the area, the likes of which Phoenix Phil had in his younger days. He uses a landscape business as a cover and launders money with the overhead. He's one of a kind, said Saul. The other three groaned. Steve began to ask how Saul got a hold of this information, but the plane began to land and the pilot began his monologue over the speakers. We are now arriving in beautiful Santa Monica. The weather is sunny with a slight northwest breeze. Please return all seats to the upright position. Close all alcoholic beverages before disembarking. And Mr. Slant, Mighty Rearranger was an amazing album. Can you sign the copy I keep in the cockpit? When they arrived at the terminal, they saw a sign with all four of their names on it. It was being held up by a very muscular Latino man. He had skull and snake tattoos on his arms. His beard covered most of his face like a biker. S. Saul McCrusty, Robert Slant, Steve Farble, Y. Senior Bozo. They were all wearing sunglasses and jackets but it was pretty clear who they were. They followed him to a limo and drove to the beachside estate. Inside, they followed the escort into a darkly lit room. He closed the door behind them as the four musicians watched a man snort coke off a woman's body like in the movie Clockwork Orange. After finishing, he said Saul, it has been a while, glad you could pay me a visit. He said this in excellent English. Hola Juan, said Saul. Juan begins I see you've been practicing your espanol Saul. Quite impressive. So. Cutting right to the point here what exactly do I owe the pleasure of your visit here? You were explaining something on the phone yesterday but you were going on and on so I put the down phone until the noise stopped. I'm a busy man here. I'll sum it up. We got to issue in New York. Everything we've worked so hard to create is being threatened and it's going to take more than what our East Coast connections can handle. So, I'm calling in the big guns. Can you do us the ultimate favor? Says Saul. If I fully get what you're asking for, it's not going to be easy gringo. Walk with me gentlemen, I need to consult with my consigli ear. They walk with Juan through the enormous beachfront property passing by several movie posters with a well-known Chinese actor who hit it big a short while ago. They entered into Juan's office to see a huge hairy ape-like man. Gentlemen. This is Rick, he's both my consigli ear and my muscle. We're gonna figure some shit out right now. After what felt like a week and a half they all sat down. The whole scene felt very Scarface-like. Juan was slouched in his chair like that one scene before he had that one boss guy killed. Anyway, Juan offers to help with the whole Derek situation if they help him with something. So, I'm in a bit of a political dilemma. As you're aware I've been living it up here for some time now tax free because of my inadvertent helping of the FBI nabbing two of the most notorious mob bosses on the west coast. Well the new administration in government isn't liking that arrangement and there's a voting to overturn it. There's one prominent politician in the area who holds a lot of influence and is voting. I need you guys to find a way to get him to vote my way by any means necessary. If you do that you will have my resources at your disposal. Bozo yelled group huddle. The four of them comically gathered into a circle. Okay, do we know of any way to get Tommy Popquiz to support Juan's illegal stay in the country? 
Tommy Popquiz was the Santa Monica mayor that opposed much of Trump's ideas on immigration. Born in Mexico himself, he was sympathetic to other Mexicans. Unfortunately, his stance on illegal immigration was still not in Juan's favor. After some banter, if it wasn't already obvious, it quickly became clear that none of them had a plan to deal with this problem. Juan coughed impatiently. Saul, the de facto leader of the group spoke up. Senor Juan, maybe you can just get a green card? Juan slowly reached for his handgun in annoyance. Or perhaps we can play a catchy ballad for Mayor Pop Quiz that will convince him of the great deed that you have done for the state of California by bringing in two of the most notorious criminals in recent history. I was hoping you would say that Juan said. Rick opened a locked chest and held up some mariachi outfits. The four of the music stars swore in ways befitting their personality but in unison. Saul clears his throat and finally says um yeah no offense but we're not exactly mariachi kind of musicians. Doesn't really go with our flow if you catch my drift. Juan reaches for his handgun again. But I'm sure we can find a way to make it work. Saul says ever so nervously. Mui bian mucacos. I knew you guys would be of use to me. Now work quickly because they're voting tomorrow. Juan says pushing them out the door.